uh, which is Introduction to Deep Learning and the Alchemy Debate. Uh, there was actually a debate with that title, roughly, uh, which I want to introduce. <coughs> and the uh, introduction to deep learning is going to be very non-technical. There'll be basically no math. Um, so of course, deep learning is in the news. Um, and uh, the, the, the goal player, uh, the world champion goal player was defeated by a computer uh, recently. Uh, they can play cards better than us. Uh, they, they are getting to the, uh, to the stage where they can drive cars roughly at human level, and we'll hear a little bit about that from one of the speakers, or maybe more than one speaker. Um, they can spot cancers on x-rays and other imaging. Uh, they can translate languages very close to human capability, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this maybe you've, uh, see, you've heard about in the news. And uh, yeah, so they call it AI, artificial intelligence, uh, but the practitioners of this field call it deep learning or machine learning. Uh, the, the term AI went a little bit out of fashion uh, some 20, 25 years ago. But uh, today what, uh, what precipitates this event and uh, why all these people are here to discuss is this debate that happened in the field over the past year. And uh, here's a... Uh, here's a title of a, an article in Science. AI researchers allege that machine learning is alchemy. Now, for the purpose of this talk, you can roughly equate machine learning and deep learning. So um, they allege that machine learning is alchemy. So here's the text uh, in larger font. Ali Rahimi, a researcher in artificial intelligence at Google in San Francisco, California, actually Mountain View, took a swipe at his field last December and received a 40-second ovation for it. Speaking at an AI conference, Rahimi charged that machine learning algorithms in which computers learn through trial and error have become a form of alchemy. Which, of course, Robert will say was a, a compliment, but uh, uh, researchers, he said, do not know why some algorithms work and others don't, nor do they have rigorous criteria for choosing one AI architecture over another, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, Rahimi wrote a paper subsequently clarifying what he meant and illustrating. <coughs> but as you can imagine, uh, a charge like that in such a popular and uh, uh, commercially important field uh, took a life of its own. And, uh, of course, there was the usual social media, Twitter, blogging, and so on. One of the speakers here today, Zach Lipton, uh, said, yeah, Ali Rahimi delivered a rare critical talk likening modern ML to alchemy. And there are some examples here which are <coughs> technical. Uh, and then Jan Lacan, the, the other speaker this morning, uh, the next day uh, posted a long note uh, which began as follows. My take on Ali Rahimi's test of time award talk at NIPS. Um, uh, Ali gave an entertaining and well-delivered talk, but I fundamentally disagree with the message. Now, Jan, you have to realize, is one of uh, the, the, uh, the founders, almost, of deep learning, or, or certainly one of the leading figures, and who, whose work has been enormously successful. So, uh, so he was clarifying, Ali gave an entertaining and well-delivered talk, but I fundamentally dis disagree with the message. The main message was, in essence, that the current practice in machine learning is akin to alchemy, his word. It's insulting, yes. Well, again, Robert would maybe disagree, but never mind that. It's wrong. Uh, and uh, so, of course, Jan will have the stage later to, to explain what he means by it's wrong. Um, but uh, let's uh, to see whether uh, this analogy makes sense and, and uh, how to debate it. Let's remember the definition of alchemy, medieval forerunner of chemistry based on supposed transformation of matter. It was concerned mostly with con converting lead into gold and with finding a universal elixir. Actually, that part isn't to mention much. I guess that is nuclear science working on it. Um, see, uh, also, um, uh, colloquially, is, it refers to any magical process of transformation, creation, or combination which also seems somewhat appropriate for, for deep learning, I guess. So yes, uh, this is the 
This is the chemical equation that they were hoping to realize by a chemical reaction. And, and as, a, as Robert said, ultimately it was done 300 years later using nuclear science. So they were uh, sort of on the right track, but, uh, but missing the main idea, uh, which is atomic physics. Uh, by the way, this teach the controversy. I don't know how many of you know it. It's a, it's a line people put on a line of t-shirts uh, referring to the controversy about uh, intelligent design. So teach both that kind of thing. Um, so what are the alchemy analogies I see in deep learning? And let me just share some with you. So of course there's a gold rush. So there's some gold metaphorically involved. And you've all heard about the, the fact that my undergrads, when they started Google or Facebook, earn probably roughly the same or more than I do. If they are really smart, they might earn a lot more than I do. Certainly the, uh, some of the PhD students. <coughs> Um, there's some magical transformation involved that was the notion of alchemy. Uh, alchemy was trying to take something cheap and plentiful, lead, and convert it into gold. Well, here we have cheap data in today's world, and you can feed that data in, in the appropriate setting to deep learning, and out comes some form of intelligence, machine intelligence. So it is somewhat magical, and it's converting something mundane into something magical. Another analogy, uh, it attracts some top scientists of its age. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, yeah, many people are definitely intrigued. The, the top scientists I encounter in a variety of settings are quite intrigued uh, about what's going on here. And there have been solid advances, go playing, translation, et cetera, where really they are approaching or exceeding human capability. And we all hope really hope that uh, we, we won't have to drive cars, and cars will drive us in a few years. So, uh, and that also is a close analogy to the alchemy uh, situation, because uh, even Isaac Newton, some, whom some consider the smartest person to ever live, uh, was an alchemist, actually, and wrote a million lines of text on, about alchemy. That was really one of his passions. And, uh, and alchemy, of course, led to fundamental changes in metallurgy, glass making, chemistry, and all kinds of other things, medicine. And finally, uh, the, the last analogy I can think of is that uh, questionable science in the sense that some people question it. Uh, uh, so possibly, uh, you know, but maybe we have too rigid a notion of what science should be, and that's something people will discuss today. And uh, probably will lead to new fields. Uh, what is intelligence is, is sort of an important scientific question today. So in this talk today, uh, I'll focus on these three things. I'll give an introduction to machine learning and deep learning, a very non-technical one. Some idea of what Rahimi meant at a non-technical level. And finally, I'll end with a brief introduction to the other speakers, uh, so just so you get a sense uh, uh, in sequence what will be covered today. So machine learning. Um, people uh, sometimes describe it in different ways, but uh, my view is that machine learning is something very old, curve-fitting, which possibly many of you learned in high school science. When you do a physics experiment and you plot the, uh, the data on some curve and you fit a curve to it, so something like this. So here's data about inflation and unemployment in Japan during a certain period, so these, the scatter plot. And you stare at that, at those points, and you see, well, it's kind of like this line, which is almost a straight line. So that line is called the Phillips curve in economics. It's funny, uh, uh, Robert anticipated a lot of the analogies here, economics he also brought up. Um, this gas law which you also encountered in high school. Uh, it connects the pressure, volume, temperature, and mass of a gas in this way. And again, it was discovered experimentally. You plotted the, these quantities uh, and, and fitted a curve. So machine learning is completely analogous. It is surface fitting of some kind. But it's not like your high school surface fitting because the number of variables is vast. Tens of millions, even billions today in the largest models. So there are a lot more variables. 
And when you fit this surface onto the data, you're learning the pattern. Just as you learn the pattern here, you're learning some more complicated pattern. So let me now say a little bit more about in what sense it's like surface fitting, because all the examples you see, like self-driving car or playing Go, doesn't feel like curve fitting. So let me say a little bit more what I mean. So here's a very simple example that you have seen that these days uh, software, namely deep learning software, can, is, is gotten really good at putting labels on pictures. What is the content of the picture? <coughs> so here's a toy task along those lines. This is an example of training data, the an analog of you know, in unemployment and inflation, that, the analog of that. So the input is a picture. That's not the result of a scientific experiment. It's a picture. And why is that data? Because a picture, as you know, is composed of pixels. So it's really a sequence of numbers. So it is data. And each picture is labeled, in this case, the simple example, with, say, dog or cat. So they're only dog or cat pictures, and they're labeled. So as I said, you can think of these pictures as data, because each picture is a sequence of numbers, the pixels in it. It's some very large data point, because as you know, today's cameras have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pixels. So it's a very large data point, and the label of the data point is dog or cat. And you can think of it as binary, dog is treated as zero, cat is one. So it's also a number. The output that you want in your machine learning algorithm, is it a cat or a dog picture, is a number. Now the goal is to use this data to train a machine to determine proper label, zero, one, given pixels in a new cat or dog image, previously unseen. That's the goal of machine learning. So you fit a curve just as you had to in the inflation and uh, unemployment setting. You fit a curve, and then you expect that the curve should predict future data points that you haven't seen. So in that sense, machine learning will try to fit some surface to the, these numbers. And then the surface should have the property. That's, that's what we can call success. If given pixels in a new cat dog image, it can properly label 0, 1. So in that sense, it's like curve fitting. Data, data is mapped into some output. So now, given this buildup, you may be wondering, what's the law of cat versus dog pictures? Now, if you ask a human what makes a picture a picture of a cat or a dog, they start saying, OK, well, it's like this, it's like that. But then you say, what about that breed of dog, which is kind of like cat? And so by the time you, know, you point out all the different breeds of cats and dogs to people, and also that the fact that the, fact that the picture could be lit in very different ways or have different orientations, it's actually not an easy way to describe what makes a picture a picture of a dog. And there could be also distracting elements, which have to be ignored. So there's no simple law, probably. And that's what unites all these applications that deep learning is trying to solve, that there's no simple law that describes the data. And so the law, if you will, uh, that's used is a deep net, which is, and this is, uh, sorry, there's some, this, uh, this is the IAS computer, and I think the fonts are a little bit off. Uh, so the deep net is something like the following. It's a sequence of transformations of the input data. So there's action one, action two, action three, action n. n could be large, like 50 or 100 or 1,000. There could be many layers. And then out comes some output, uh, some output zero. So you can think of these as little programs or circuits. But D refers to the fact that it's got multiple layers. And that seems to be important. Now, what is an action? Well, I won't describe the action too much. Maybe some of the other speakers will actually put uh, more details on it. But at an intuitive level, an action uh, is some kind of a computation that depends on a large bank of parameters. And you can think of a parameter, that's the analogy often given, as a tunable knob. Now, often when this analogy is given that deep learning has these tunable knobs, everybody nods and says, yeah, I understand how knobs work, right? We all have knobs in our car stereo. Well, let me emphasize that there's some important differences compared to your intuition of how knobs work in deep learning. Okay, so that's why the analogy is a little subtle. 
So firstly, of course, the number of knobs is very large. Okay, in your car stereo, they have four or five knobs tops, uh, and each has a purpose. And here, the number of knobs, as I mentioned, is the number of parameters, which could be hundreds of millions or even billions. So imagine, if you will, a football stadium, chock full of knobs. Okay, and you walk through that stadium and adjust those knobs. Okay, if you want to train this network. So there's a lot of knobs. That's the first thing. But more importantly, more importantly, the effect of each knob depends on the knob settings of previous layers. Actually, I should say, actually all the layers, okay? Each knob's uh, effect depends on the settings of the other, other knobs. Let me emphasize this is completely contrary to your way of thinking of knobs. When you try to make the car stereo do what you want it to do, you turn one knob which tunes it to the right radio station. Then you turn another knob which adjusts the volume, another knob that adjusts the left-right balance. Each knob has a purpose. It's been designed to do that. And they don't interfere with each other. Here, every knob interferes with every other knob, potentially. Okay, and if you know about electrical circuit, it's really an electrical circuit of knobs, okay, which are feeding into each other. And so they're affecting, their effect depends on the value of the other knobs. This is fundamentally different. Imagine your car radio ha had this system, you know, this complicated system. It would drive you nuts. You would adjust one knob and get, ah, the radio is correct. Now you start adjusting the volume and the radio station changes. Okay, so this is fundamentally different. So in that sense, the knob analogy should be taken somewhat carefully. But this is very important. This is important for the success of deep learning that it's a circuit of knobs. And it's important and very germane to the alchemy debate that we'll now talk about. So the training procedure for deep nets is to find the right settings for these knobs. And I'll say a little bit more about the training procedure, but the idea is that using a large training set of labeled inputs, there's an algorithm, a knob tuning algorithm, which adjusts these knobs all together to make the nets output match the labeled outputs as closely as possible. So to give you an analogy with the car radio, if the car radio was designed in this crazy way or constructed in this crazy way, you would want to hear classical music and you have some idea that there's a classical music station out there and you'll keep twirling the knobs, trial and error, essentially, until classical music comes out because there's no notion of the knob tuning to a correct station or the right volume, etc. So this algorithm is an optimization algorithm. It's trying to optimize a certain function, just as curve fitting does. And for simplicity, we can think of the training objective function uh, of this optimization as minimize the sum of squared errors. So the true label, 0, 1, binary, and then the net's output, which is some number. And the difference between the two, square it up and sum, sum it over all the inputs. This is the objective. So this objective is trying to make sure that the net on the training data is producing the right output or close to the right output. So here's the first mystery about uh, deep learning that some of the debate was ref uh, referring to. That the mystery about this is that efficient optimization is possible. Like the way I described that hypothetical car radio with millions of knobs and each knob affecting everything else, it seems like a nightmare to get, any, get it to do anything. But somehow, in deep learning, there's this algorithm, a very basic algorithm that you learn in calculus, gradient descent, which, find, which seems to do pretty well in practice. And gradient descent, the idea is kind of like following the gradient, as the name suggests. So I, I'm illustrating that in that picture by this, by this three-dimensional curve, or three-dimensional surface. So the x-axis and the y-axis are the settings of two knobs. I'm assuming there are only two knobs in this picture, not a million or 10 million. So just two knobs. So with those two knobs, the, you determine the behavior of the net. And then depending on the tuning of each knob, the, the objective that you're trying to minimize has a certain value. So that's the z-coordinate. So that's the, that's the surface I'm drawing there. So it's, that surface is it's a conceptual uh, uh, it's conceptually we're thinking of it this way, that uh, there are these two variables which you can vary, the tunable knobs, 
and then each, of the, uh, each setting of those knobs determines the value of the objective. And in this surface, you're trying to find a low point where the training objective is small, where the net's output matches the desired output as much as possible. So gradient descent, as the name suggests, is the algorithm that water follows. You know, water always follows the direction where the slope goes down, right? It falls down. Uh, and gradient descent does that as well, that there's a clear direction of up and down, right? The training objective. High objective, low objective. You want the objective to be small. So you always incrementally adjust the knobs a little bit, little bit, little bit each time in the direction of maximum change. And the direction of maximum change is available via calculus called the derivative. This is elementary calculus. Now, what's the, what's the mystery? Well, as that picture suggests, that trading objective has all kinds of ups and downs, peaks and valleys. So it's what's called non-convex. And a lot of the classical analysis of optimization is for convex, where there's only a single uh, valley. So when it's convex, it's clear that gradient descent should fall to the bottom of the valley. If, it just, you, know, if you put a drop of water it'll, or, or a marble, it'll roll down to the bottom. The only question is how fast? And that's what people would study a lot. There's a very vast area. But for non-convex uh, uh, training objectives, it's not clear what gradient descent would do. It depends on where you start it, which valley it falls into. And it's not clear why any, any old valley is good enough. But turns out it's pretty, pretty decent in practice. So unclear why gradient descent works so well. Flies against experts' intuitions, the old, uh, all the old uh, intuitions in optimization. And there are many tricks for modifying gradient descent and or knob structure, the architecture of the net. And that's what Rahimi was referring to in that critique, that there's just a lot of things you have to adjust by trial and error. Here's a second mystery about deep learning. Overfitting, let me explain what overfitting is. So remember this example of the curve we fitted to inflation versus unemployment data? You could have fitted a different curve, which actually fits the data better. It's a more complicated curve. It's not a simple line-like object. It's this uh, curve with many ups and downs. And it fits, happens to fit the data better. Was there a question? So this is something that uh, scientists have th thought about. And the rule of thumb, and this can be made mathematically precise uh, in some settings, that overcomplicated ex uh, explanations overfit to training data and do not generalize to explaining new data. Okay? Uh, an overcomplicated explanation you can think of as analogous to a conspiracy theory. You know about these crazy conspiracy theories you read about, about something or the other, where they connect the Kennedy assassination with with particle physics, you know, I'm making it up, but like <laughs> crazy things. So, uh, so you can have an overcomplicated explanation, but then the task for that theory or that explanation is that it has to fit, it has to explain new data. And that's what an overcomplicated explanation does not do, and that's an old principle in philosophy due to Occam, uh, it's called Occam's razor. So here's the mystery, that the deep nets that we're using today have a lot of parameters, these knobs. And the number of parameters is actually more than the number of training data, way more in many settings, which, according to the classical thinking, is a recipe for overfitting, for this kind of behavior, not that on the left. So the mystery, I'm reminded of Sherlock Holmes, who said, the mystery is not why the dog barked. The mystery is why the dog did not bark. And so the mystery is no overfitting, not overfitting. That you would expect the overfitting to happen. You would expect the dog to bark, but somehow the dog doesn't bark, and overfitting does not happen. So just to uh, give you, uh, this is uh, using, uh, describing the curves conceptually. Uh, and I thought I would put this in just because you might be seeing other curves later in the talks, in other talks, so I'll just warm you up with this kind of thinking. So uh, on the left is prediction error. Actually, I called it earlier training objective. I apologize. The training objective. And 
there's one curve for training data and one for test data, data you haven't seen. So that's held out data that you don't use in training. And so as you increase the model complexity in the number of knobs in it, you'll fit the training data better and better. But this Occam principle, suitably formalized, would suggest that at some point as you make the model too big, too large, it doesn't predict the new data very well. So the error on the new data, on the unseen data, goes up as you make the model complicated. So this is called generalization error. So this is another buzzword you might see in some of the talks today. <coughs> okay, now this doesn't happen. In real life deep learning, you increase the model size and somehow something magical happens in this gradient descent, uh, which people are now beginning to understand a little bit. And it doesn't overfit, by and large. Or maybe overfits very little. So somehow it's very resistant to overfitting. So summarizing the previous slides, there's no good theory or math for why or when deep learning works in the sense that, um, that you might say, you know, like theory or math like particle physics, like uh, uh, quantum mechanics or Newton's laws or something like that. And maybe it's quite conceivable that there is no such simple law. We started with that point that there probably is no simple law even saying what makes a picture of a uh, uh, sequence of pixels a picture of a dog. So there are, there's all variants of semi-theory, uh, uh, intuitions which are somewhat mathematical to justify, explain various phenomena, and these are very valuable, and they could evolve into being more rigorous someday. There's another uh, branch of work where you sort of mask out some aspects of deep learning and focus on some other aspect, and then you can have a reasonably good theory. So these are, of course, along the lines of what people have done in science all along. And the, what I showed you in the previous few slides, I would say primarily affects ML experts, not you users primarily. Because, uh, you know, understand, so the expert, it's the expert's job to, to design these new networks for whatever, self-driving car or translation or whatever. And what this reality implies is that the experts have to work extra hard. And they need to have good intuition and, and it's somewhat of an art and that's why possibly they get those large salaries I alluded to earlier. Um, and the alchemy debate was primarily about this. Um, many prior approaches in the field use simpler models with more predictable properties. And so Rahimi was alluding to this earlier world where things were much cleaner and they've gotten a lot more complex today. So that's a summary of, uh, one summary of the alchemy debate. But there's another aspect of the alchemy debate which I think is more interesting or relevant to the average person, which is the interpretability problem. And I think today some of the speakers will talk about that too. So remember that the training algorithm is just using gradient descent to this calculus procedure to adjust tens of millions of knobs to achieve the desired input output behavior on the training data. And that these knobs were all interconnected that the that the effect of this knob depends on all the other knobs. So what that means is that as the algorithm adjusts all these knobs in tandem and using some rule we don't fully understand, it's not clear why at the end, why machine gave the answer it did. You can't point to any knob setting or anything. It's just the full setting of all the millions of knobs, of tens of millions of knobs, which describes the answer. It's a complicated model of reality. And this is very relevant to you because if these systems are uh, doing medical diagnoses or deciding whether you get a loan or all those things that affect your life, uh, in general you want an answer. So it would be very nice to have more interoperability in machine learning. Now of course, people point out when this is brought up that there isn't a lot of interoperability in human decision making, you know, as all of us who've ever tried to call customer support for anything know. So, uh, okay, but I think it is a problem. Scientifically, it's an interesting problem. And, and again, people are thinking about it, but it's in the, it's in the early stages. So this point um, may, makes me want to emphasize something that is a feature of today's machine learning, which you should be aware of, which is a distinction between design and learned systems. And we've discussed this already in the in context of the knob tuning. 
So we are all, of course, used in the last century or so by, uh, to, having, to being surrounded by complicated objects, which are designed by vast teams using millions of lines of computer code. And, and these objects are magical to us. You know, what a smartphone can do, why a jumbo jet can fly. Uh, and of course, people 100 years ago would have been completely uh, mystified what's in there. So, so we are surrounded by that and we, we are used to complexity. But the important thing is that these are designed. Somebody in this vast team knows the purpose of each compo component and what to do if it's going wrong, et cetera, et cetera. These are designed components. These are designed objects. I mean, they might use computer software to design, but still, they have a pretty good idea. Contrast with the deep net. The designer is using trial and error to select the architecture and optimization algorithm. Then the gradient descent algorithm that I mentioned earlier, I forgot to say this earlier. The initial setting, you have to start it off at, with some initial settings of the knobs. And the initial settings are usually random. You start with random settings to the knobs. And then you do this gradient descent to let the net learn some knob settings from the data. And that's inherently different from, from a design system. It's a learned system. And nobody, meaning no person, really understands what various components learned and how they affect each other. This is something to be aware of. And maybe there's nothing strange here. You know, probably uh, all technology is at some, some level a mystery and, uh, uh, and complicated technology even more so. So maybe we'll just get used to this, but it's something to be aware of that it's a learned system and we don't know the purpose of the individual components too well. So that's what Ali was uh, referring to, uh, that he would like to live in a society whose systems are built on top of verifiable, rigorous, thorough knowledge and not on alchemy. It's a bold statement. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, Ali is very well versed in deep learning and the older method. So uh, he, he, he's definitely, uh, qualified to, to make this statement. But uh, Jan uh, uh, wrote back in his response that engineering artifacts have almost always preceded the theoretical understanding. It is important to invent new techniques and yes, tricks. You know, even when you don't have theoretical understanding and maybe theoretical understanding will catch up. And of course, we all know of examples like this. Uh, there were, there were uh, steam engines drawing people even back in 1829, but it took 50 plus years to begin to start understanding them. And so that's what Jan is referring to, that almost certainly this process will happen for an important technology. So then in a subsequent manifesto, so I'm, I'm uh, describing this, by the way, because neither Rahimi nor Recht were able to come to today's, uh, session, uh, to today's event. And so I'm sort of summarizing, ideally I would have liked them to step up here and explain what they were saying. So I'm just uh, describing it for you. So uh, it turns out the, this whole position paper was written by the two of them jointly. And they clarified that actually they didn't mean to impugn the field, and they wanted me to emphasize that in my remarks, that they were, in their subsequent uh, manifesto, they said, look, even if it's complicated, we want something that you can uh, hold on to, some understanding, some pedagogical nuggets to help people understand, theorems for simple subcases, simple experiments, more scientific and honest reporting of what does or doesn't work, honest comparisons with baselines. So these are some of the things they meant, that uh, why you know, the absence of this or not rigorous adherence to this uh, is turning the field into alchemy. Well, to something like that, of course, the answer is amen. Yeah, I mean, should we all exercise more and eat better? Yeah, eat healthily. Yeah, so these are, these are of course, uncontroversial. I think everybody agrees with this. And some of the speakers today will uh, address this. So which brings me to uh, today's amazing speaker lineup. They represent diverse fields that leverage deep learning and have arrived at deep learning from various, uh, through, along various paths. So the first speaker is uh, Zach Lipton from CMU, uh, who spent some time in industry and then has recently moved there. Uh, his expertise is indeed machine learning and its societal impact. That's uh, uh, that's, he's a master expositor of that. Uh, and he's interested in issues of robustness, fairness, and sample complexity, some of the things that I sketched already. Uh, fairness refers to you know, whether 
they can, machine learning can pick up on existing biases in society. And you, you end up with a system that's actually more biased than, than uh, even uh, society is today. Uh, he's an author, blogger, expositor. I recommend his blog. And uh, also his uh, saxophone album you can uh, stream on Tidal and other services. And I highly recommend it. I was listening to it last night. Um, Next speaker will be Jan Lecun, uh, a very eminent person in deep learning, uh, director of AI research uh, at Facebook. He was personally recruited by Mark Zuckerberg uh, a few years ago. Also the uh, founding head of the New York University Center for Data Science, member of the National Academy, and ha uh, has won many awards, including the Neural Network Pioneer Award, which actually describes exactly what he is. He's one of the two or three pioneers of deep learning today, especially uh, about convolutional neural nets, which he'll talk about, I think, uh, and he's done foundational work in all types of deep learning. The next speaker will be uh, uh, Joel Pinot, uh, who's a co-director of the McGill Reasoning and Learning Lab and also head of Facebook Research in Montreal. The, Facebook, the two Facebook people was sort of just a coincidence. Uh, as you probably know, to get an event like this going, you have to invite people and somehow you can't plan ahead of time the, the, uh, who, uh, who accepts. So uh, great, very grateful she, can co she could come. I had to really convince her to come for a day. Uh, world expert in decision making for robotics, uh, especially algorithms for planning and learning in partially observable domains, which is, of course, what happens in self-driving cars, that the full reality is not observable to you, and you have to infer uh, what may be going on. Very interested these days in how to imp uh, improve reproducibility of ML research. Uh, uh, and she has a lot of writings on that. Uh, Sharshalev Schwartz, uh, professor at Hebrew University and also a scientist at Mobileye. Now, Mobileye is a company you may not have heard of because it makes self-driving systems that exist today in a lot of the cars. And uh, it's an OEM company, so that's why you don't hear about it, but they are actually quite large and influential. And uh, he is a world expert in theoretical machine learning. Uh, but lately interested uh, due to his stint at Mobileye in problems arising in design of self-driving cars, where he's adopted deep learning, and he'll tell us a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, he, he bridges the old theoretical view and the deep learning view that, uh, that Rahimi's critique was referring to, and so he can maybe address that for us. And finally, there's Mike Collins, uh, professor at Columbia University and also at Google Research. Uh, ACL Fellow, and a very long list of best paper awards at top venues. Uh, he's uh, the world ex he's A, or maybe even the top world expert in natural language processing, and one of its deep thinkers. And in the last few years, is leveraging deep learning for NLP. <coughs> so some points of discussion today. How have the various speakers adopted deep learning in their domains? Um, this mix of uh, heuristics, engineering, science, rigor, how are they uh, what do they think about it and uh, their perspective on how does the field split currently around these and what is the right mix going forward? How can alchemy, if any, evolve into science or maybe as Robert will say, devolve because maybe it's better than science? How desirable is it and how realistic is it to completely understand machine intelligence given we don't even understand ourselves? So maybe understanding should be in quotes and it's, never, it's not clear what that will be. Uh, what kinds of problems societal technological can arise from lack of understanding and deep learning? So concluding thoughts, uh, intelligent machines has been an old dream, including at Princeton. So Turing, von Neumann, and Gödel were all, all spent their, some of their formative years at Princeton. Um, and uh, that's Lady Ada, who is an early pioneer and uh, who imagined in, back in the 19th century, early 19th century, um, uh, intelligent machines. <coughs> it's becoming a reality today thanks to uh, ability to train vast models using vast streams of data, fast op optimization methods, fast computers, lots of tricks. But intelligent behavior is complicated as I hope I've convinced you and let's hear from our distinguished experts how they are probing its mysteries while navigating the alchemy science spectrum. Thank you very much.